it all sounds so easy. A camera scans a scene and transmits the result to a display. The display reflects everything the camera sees in full, living color. <laughs> Would that it were so easy. The actual connections between a camera and a control module, and between the control module and a display, are fraught with legacy considerations and technological limitations and hard, cold physics. To tell this story, we need to talk about color. Pretty much everyone understands that white light is made up of a wide range of wavelengths. The human eye can perceive electromagnetic radiation in the range of about 400 to about 700 nanometers. Or, put another way, in the frequency range of about 430 terahertz to about 750 terahertz. Venture outside this range and your eyes see nothing. Your eyes can perceive all radiation in that range, but it's not really as simple as all that. The retina of the human eye contains two kinds of cells capable of detecting light, rods and cones. The cones are responsible for color vision and are tuned to distinguish just three colors. A short wavelength color centered around blue, a medium wavelength color centered around yellow-green, and a long wavelength color centered around orange. The rods detect only a relatively narrow band of color centered around bluish green, but they are much more densely packed and much more sensitive to light than the cones. The retina of the eye and the visual cortex of the brain work together to interpolate all these inputs so you can perceive the roughly 10 million colors most people are able to distinguish. Now, in a way, modern cameras work in much the same fashion. There are photoreceptors arranged in an array that detect different wavelengths of light, and a processor is necessary to read the values from the photoreceptors and create an image based on those values. In some sensors, each photoreceptor site is associated with a color filter, red, blue, or green. The arrangement you see here is called a Bayer pattern. In the Bayer pattern, there are twice as many green photoreceptors as blue or red. That's a nod to the rods. Remember, rods are most sensitive to light in the greenish-blue range, and it just makes sense to devote more sensor resolution to wavelengths at which the eye is most sensitive. Other sensors don't use a green filter at all. In each quad, they have a blue photoreceptor, a red photoreceptor, and two photoreceptors that don't have a filter at all. From the output of those photoreceptors, you can compute a green channel, but the sensors based on this pattern are more sensitive since you're not filtering out a significant part of the light. But that raises the first issue. It's much easier to treat each pixel, that is, each picture element, as a combination of the three primary colors, and not some oddball combination of colors that's dictated by the sensor. And at one time, sensors would present an RGB signal that's ready for processing. But now, more and more frequently, the sensor sends raw data from the photoreceptors over its data lines, and it's up to logic in the controller to reconstruct a picture based on that data. The second issue is bandwidth. We saw before how a simple HD signal can balloon into gigabits per second of data. The question is, how would one reduce the overall bandwidth required by the video signal without seriously impacting the video quality? Well, back in the 1940s, engineers working on the first all-electronic color television systems were faced with the same question. How do you fit color information into a channel just 4.5 megahertz wide designed for a black-and-white, luminance-only picture. The solution they arrived at was to create a luminance signal that represented the sum of the red, blue, and green channels, and then to create a quadrature amplitude-modulated chrominance subcarrier that contained the difference between red minus intensity and blue minus intensity. From these signals, it's pretty easy to recreate the red, blue, and green channels, and receivers without color capability can just use the regular intensity signal. And, and this is kind of the interesting part for us, 
the color carrier can have a significantly lower bandwidth than the luminance carrier. Instead of a little more than 4 MHz, the color information occupies only a little more than 1 MHz. And that system worked because the eye perceives differences in brightness at a much higher resolution than it perceives differences in color. In a sense, the eye doesn't care if the color of an object is rendered at a lower resolution. As long as the luminance is sharp and accurate, the eye is generally happy. And in that regard, modern image signal processors are a lot like the visual cortex. They primarily depend on the luminance signal to perform object detection and recognition. Modern machine vision systems might not render an image in RGB space at all. They may render an image in YUV space. Y is intensity, U is blue minus intensity, and V is red minus intensity. And U and V may be rendered at lower resolution or lower bit depth than Y. For example, some image sensors will send, for one pixel, the Y value and the U value, and then for the next pixel, send the Y value and the V value. The image processor knows the intensity value for every pixel, but it only gets complete chroma information for every pair of pixels. And, and that's okay. For each pixel, the image processor will look at adjacent pixels and compute the most likely correct color value for that pixel. Now, because the eye is relatively less sensitive to color differences, you won't notice the lower bandwidth associated with the image, and any object recognition or machine learning functions will be perfectly happy with the full bandwidth intensity information. The third issue with camera interfacing is that of data presentation. It wasn't long ago that a VGA quality camera would present its data as parallel RGB, but those parallel interfaces don't make a lot of sense for modern, high resolution image sensors. Current camera sensors present their data on multiple CSI lanes that contain the raw output from the photoreceptor sites. It's then up to the image processor to convert that to RGB space, or to YUV space, or whatever color space is needed by the system. The serializer's job is to capture this video stream in whatever format the camera presents it, and convert that torrent of data to a single high-speed serial bitstream. Then the deserializer captures the bitstream and turns it into something usable for the electronics control module or for the display. In GMSL, whatever comes into the serializer goes out of the deserializer. That is, the data presented to the parallel inputs on the serializer are sampled on the pixel clock. The data is serialized and the deserializer recovers the pixel clock and presents the sampled parallel signals on its outputs. Those sampled signals may be the red, blue, and green outputs from the camera. They might be signals in the YUV color space, or the signals could be something else entirely. The point is, GMSL just doesn't care. What goes in is what comes out. But what is the physical nature of those signals? If the camera generates a parallel output, then the signals are very likely standard low-voltage CMOS that's sampled at the pixel clock frequency, and that could range from a few tens of megahertz to 100 megahertz, or maybe even higher. But many modern cameras send their data in a serialized format over one or more data lanes, and HDMI sources send their video and synchronization data over three differential serial lanes as well. So, a GMSL serializer may have to do a little deserializing before it can even get to the serializer job. And what about the display? Just like cameras, displays used to expect you to provide data as parallel red, green, and blue channels. And just like cameras, as displays have become denser and more sophisticated, they've turned to other techniques like Embedded DisplayPort or DSi, both of which can use multiple lanes of differential serial data. But it's not as simple as one lane for red, another for blue, and another for green. The bits that comprise each primary color are often mixed between the data lanes, and it's up to the controller to figure out what goes where. 
In a typical automotive system, you'll have multiple video sources, cameras, sensors, backseat entertainment players, as well as computer sources that generate maps and other data. And multiple video syncs, the dashboard display, backseat displays, and many of these will interconnect over high-speed serial links like Maxim's GMSL devices. That's why it's important that these devices support pretty much every possible kind of image sensor or display type. You just never know what you're going to get. The lesson you should take away from this is that even though there are many different camera interface standards and lots of ways that displays connect to controllers, Maxim has you covered. There are lots of physical interfaces and many more ways those physical interfaces mix the bits from the video streams. But Maxim serializers and deserializers are flexible enough to handle most any combination of cameras, displays, and control modules. Stay tuned to this channel for more about Maxim's GMSL interface products.